Give you your Bibles, you could turn to Ephesians, the book of Ephesians we've been walking through for some time. Um, but we're now in chapter 5 of the book of Ephesians. We've been looking at our position in Christ, but also how we walk. Paul's very practical in how he continues to lead us. We've, we've looked at how he prayed that we would have an understanding of the position that we have. When, when we're in Christ, we're a new creation. Amen? The Bible says all things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Now, it doesn't mean that our behavior has lined up with our belief yet. Amen? And so Paul is saying here that it's important for us to understand our foundation in the first three chapters of Ephesians deals with this aspect of who we are in Christ. And then when we begin in chapter 4, he begins to lay out for us how we're to walk in Christ. How we're to walk as a people. And we're, we're here looking at chapter 5 now, beginning in verse 22. And in the time of the early church, there was a type of literature called household texts. And these texts fell into two types. One was an individual household and the other was the, the larger household community. When we speak of the church, we're talking about a, a larger household community because you hear us refer to ourselves as a family of families. We are composed of families, but when we come together, we're a family of families. Amen? There, there's a relationship. And, and today, you know, when Paul wrote the letters to the churches, he used these two type of, of uh, context, a two type of, of household text. And, and today, in our continued study of Ephesians, we're going to look at the text that speaks of an individual household. And the purpose of the individual household text is to give a picture of the guidelines for life as a family. Especially in how we are to live as a family in the midst of a family. How, how we are to be a people in the midst of a community that God's called forth. And Paul and Peter both use this format in the culture in which they live in to explain about families of Christians and how we as Christians also must live within the church, which is God's family. And, and there are three individual household texts in the New Testament. One here in Ephesians 5, 22 to 6, chapter 6, verse 9. You also can look in Colossians 3, verse 18 to chapter 4, verse 1. And then there's 1 Peter 3, verse 1 to 7. But today we're going to specifically look at this Ephesian passage. And in a time when, when the guidelines for marriage and family life are, are being redefined by our culture, I think it's important that we build our marriages and our families upon the design that God has for us. Amen? And remember, you want to recall as we were studying through the book of Ephesians, that Paul understood his job description from the Lord as revealing the administration of Christ's church. He used the word house law or, or, or administration that we look at, but, but he's saying here's the guidelines for how the church is to operate in this time, and that means that the guidelines of Christ were designed for families that were part of his family, and therefore they're to be practiced by all the churches. And, and the structure begins very simple, but let's here first read through chapter 5, beginning in verse 22. And we're going to read on through verse 9 of chapter 6, and then we'll get through what we can today. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church. He is the Savior of the body, therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, 
that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. And he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you, in particular, so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you, and you may live long on the earth. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Bondhold or bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in sincerity of heart as to Christ, not with eye service as men pleases, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. And you masters, do the same thing to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. When we begin to look at this passage, we realize that the structure of the passage is very simple. Paul directly addresses each household member, wives, husbands, children, fathers, slaves, masters. The entire household, the entire unit is being addressed and they are being addressed in a logical order. He first addresses those that are under authority and then he addresses those that are in authority. He begins that wives are to submit to their husbands, that children are to obey their parents, and that slaves are to obey their masters. But then he also says that husbands are to love their wives, fathers are to patiently train their children, masters are to treat their slaves kindly. The individual household is in view in the entire passage when he begins to speak to us here. We, we mention masters and slaves, uh, they're mentioned since many of the households in the culture included servants. Some of them were hired and some of them were indentured. Therefore, the instructions that he gives was needed to give to everyone in the household since the household unit was a smaller unit within the household of God. And it's important for us to begin to, to see that idea because the directives that were given to slaves and masters uh, and mainly today might be applicable to cultures where similar household structures exist, but we can also apply some of those things to our work environments. Now some people would argue that this passage should only apply to the early church culture. And if your thinking is that, then there's a twofold problem that we have when we look at that kind of thinking. Because first of all, we remember that Paul was describing his job description was to explain how Christ is ordering the household of God. We are the possessors of truth, he says, worldwide. The church is the ground, the pillar and supporter of the truth. And what he's doing here, he's giving order to the individual households of faith. The second thing that we have to understand is the purpose of this entire letter that we've been studying to the Ephesians needs to be considered in respect to this passage. Because Paul is instructing the church of Ephesians how they should walk as Christians. We, we've been dealing with that. And so the, the passage, this particular passage, is an important part to the overall piece. And some would argue that, well, the passage is not teaching that wives should be submissive to their husbands, but there must be mutual submission of the wife to the husband and husband to the wife. And, and at one level, we could say that's true. 
because all of us must be subject to one another. In fact, in verse 21 of the previous section, it said that we should submit to one another in the fear of God. But in the context of what that is speaking is that we should submit to each other in order of our responsibilities. Husbands are to lead and to love their wives. And wives are to follow and respect their husbands. It's saying here children are to obey their parents. But fathers are to assume the responsibility for the shaping and spiritual direction of that child. See, there are couplets all the way through here that he's speaking of. Slaves are to submit to their masters, but masters are to deal patiently with their slaves. You, you must ask yourself, what is the logic of the passage of Paul's letter, of, of his writings that he gives here? Is it that he didn't like women and children? Was he just a, a product of his times when, when women had little value? But the passage to me is clear that the husband is to love his wife as much as Christ loves us, even giving up his life for her. He's saying here that the husband is to cherish her. He is to give significant, patient attention to the development of his children. Why these directives? Why does Paul give us these directives? It's because Christ has a plan for his people. His plan centers on the church, that the church is a family of families. And for the church to function in an orderly way, the family must be functioning in an orderly way. God created all these things, and he created order to things. And when we follow his created order, families and church work. In our contemporary culture, particularly our Western culture, this seems foreign. It could even seem archaic to you. We, we, because our culture communicates such a different message than what I'm speaking this morning. We're, we're, we're going in the opposite direction of all of these guidelines, and what is the result, I ask you? Our families are fragmented. Authority is breaking down. We're creating a generation of children that are devoid of all the benefits of the character and the securities of a stable family life in which men are leading in the home. See, once the father's role as a leader of the family is abandoned, and we have that all around us today, all levels of the family, all level of the community begin to be disintegrated. Christ has a plan for his church. It includes the guidelines that he gives us for individual families. He expects us to follow it. He gives it to us for very good reasons. The teaching and how to conduct particular relationships, such as a husband-wife relationship. It was part of this greater body of Christian teaching on personal relationships. It, it can be found in many different areas of the New Testament. The, the household codes that, that is found here in Ephesians, it's embedded in the larger section of Scripture that we have been calling how to live in the body of Christ. There's a work for us. We, we need to learn how to get along with each other. We got to learn how to walk as Christians. Amen? And, and in this Ephesians larger section of Scripture, it begins with the exhortation to live in a united way as a member of the body of Christ. It proceeds through this discussion of the old life, which we have to put off, and the new life that we must embrace if we're going to love one another in Christ. It begins by us living in holiness. And now he comes to the household code. Just before he speaks about marriage, what well, Paul has given us in exhortations like this, be angry but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another. Tender-hearted, 
forgiving one another just as Christ has forgiven you. In other words, the contents of the teaching on order in the husband-wife relationship is a teaching on basic Christian love. If we're going to successfully live in God's order for marriage, husbands and wives need to put away bitterness. Put away wrath. Put away anger. And any other sinful activity and begin to be kind and tender-hearted toward each other. The household code in Ephesians, it doesn't teach everything. It doesn't say everything that goes into the relationship. If you think about this, that, that if you think about a house, there's a structure to that house. You know, those of us that are, that are builders, we understand. We go into a house and we're not so much concerned with the rugs or the curtains or the pictures on the walls. If you're buying a house, you want to know, is the structure sound? Is the foundation good? Is the structure of the house going to be so that when the winds blow and the rains come, you're going to be good inside? When we look at this text, what we're seeing is the structure of the house, okay? We're seeing the structure of the home. Now, every one of us has different pictures and different carpet and different draperies and all those things that you decorate inside. And so we're not talking about everything there is to know about how our relationships are to be built. But we're saying there's a basic structure that all of us need to adhere to. The basic design. One main guideline for the wife, and one main guideline for the husband. For the wife, she is to respect her husband. In essence, what he's saying is that you submit under authority. And the husband, the main guideline is this, that he is to love his wife. And the main essence of loving your wife is that you would lay down your life for her. passage unpacks these guidelines. It helps us to get uh, uh, the full implication of what each of these things mean. And, and we're going to look at this a little bit more in depth. But follow the logic of the passage. First, the guideline for the wives. Don't be nudging your wife, husbands, because I'm coming to you next. It says, wives, respect your husbands. What does this mean in the context of what he's speaking here? The, the core idea here is that, that wives are to be subject to their own husbands. And in the New American Standard, you notice the phrase in italics, it says, be subject. And that means it's implied in the text, but it's not actual words in the text itself. But the words, be subject, do appear in 521 of Ephesians and also 524. And some argue that since it states that in, in verse 21, that we are to be subject to each other. That the wife is to be subject to her husband and the husband to his wife. And yet in the passage, it clearly speaks forth here that the wife is to be subject to her husband. Not everybody's husband. Her husband. Amen? That she is to be subject to her husband. And, and, and we also see that that, that It's the same thing as when it says for children to obey their parents, okay? There, there's, there's a specific declaration in here. And this word submission, this is what it actually means. It means to assume a place or position under another person. Now, I, I know this is uh, things that we have a difficult time understanding. And some of the synonyms for this would mean that you would subordinate yourself or you would submit yourself, or even to obey. And it's used in a, in a military rank for a subordinate rank. In other words, the standard that is set forth for Christ and his church. It's the same standard that Christ subordinated himself to his Father. And the church is to subordinate herself to Christ. We are subject as a church to Christ in everything. 
And here it's saying there's a comparison here of a wife to her husband. And the reason that the wife is to submit to her husband is that the husband is head of the family as Christ is head of the church which is God's household. There's an order, logical explanation for the way in which God has structured the family. It has nothing to do with the value of one person over another. It's a reflection of God's design. In essence, it's a reflection of God's wisdom. To, to, to go against God's design is to go against His wisdom and says that you have your own wisdom. And Paul had previously addressed the Corinthian church concerning this order in 1 Corinthians 11. And there he states that Christ is the head of man, and man is the head of woman, and God is the head of Christ. Now is God greater, of greater value than Christ? Of course not. All of this somehow reflects the, the wisdom of God's design of all things. And, and I'm convinced the more that we reflect on the design, we can see the manifold wisdom of God in full display in our lives. The, the essence of this guideline for the wife is summed up in a word, respect. The, the heart of submission idea is far more than it makes a, a final decision. It's much more than just somebody makes a final decision if you can't agree on something. It's far more than, well, somebody has to lead, so God it just happened to choose the husband. It's tied to the very design of manhood and womanhood that God made. And respect literally means to, to show or, or to fear someone, but it doesn't mean to be afraid. It means to show a reverence as one toward anyone that's carrying on an especially important role or responsibility. In other words, I'm esteeming them, I'm respecting them because they have a role and a responsibility to care. Now, now we are to do that even with our government officials, right? We are to respect them. It doesn't necessarily mean that we agree with everything they do. But there should be a respect because, you know what, ultimately, women, understand this, your husband will be judged by God for what he does for the leadership of his home. When you come under that authority, what you're doing is say, God, I trust you enough to deal with him. I trust you enough, Lord, that you will shape him. I, I trust you enough that I'm going to come under that authority. Doesn't mean you're not a helpmate. Doesn't mean that you don't, you know, give, give your, your valuable insight to the situations that we are. It just simply means that we come to a place of respect and it reflects an inner attitude of spirit as well. We, we could further develop this in 1 Peter 3, but I only want to deal with this one text today. Now here's the guideline for husbands. Before you're yay, amen in me for the first part. Here's the simple guideline. One simple guideline, okay? Can you get this part right? Husbands love your wives. But we have to ask, what does that mean in the context of what Jesus has given us through Paul or, or how Paul is trying to get of us? It's saying here there's a standard that is set forth the standard is this. Here's the standard you have. Christ's love for the church is your standard. The essence of a love that Christ had for the church is he gave himself up for her. He was willing to die for the church. Husbands, you need to be committed to your wife. Willing to die for her. Not just physically. I think you need to die of some other things too. We have to die of some things of ourselves for our wives. Amen? Amen. Christ loved his church and that love for the church was developmental in nature because he wanted to mature the church. He wanted the church to become all that God intended the church to be. To fully develop the church. To, to completely mature the church. And so a husband is to use all of his resources and abilities to help his wife mature in Christ. In other words, you don't just pursue your own spiritual growth independent of your wife. You don't serve your own interests, but you are to serve her interests 
fully as your own interests. Because there's no difference because the Bible says you are truly one. The, the idea is that we're, we're lifting her up to present her to the Lord. And in, in fact, uh, Paul goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 2, especially verse 24, when he backs up his point, he says it in this context, the woman who was created from man and brought to him is to become one flesh with him. The implication of being one flesh is that the man is to care for her as he would care for himself. You don't view a wife like a possession. You, you view your wife like you would view yourself. Everything is shared. Whatever you have is hers. Because she's part of you. Just as you would, you, you would seek to grow in Christ and be all that God intended you to be. Well, well, your love for your wife is to see that she is cherished and nurtured and, and built up. The idea of these roles are, are tied back to the very nature of what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman. That This is what the scripture is saying. And Paul's drawing from this passage in Genesis defining who a man and a woman is. The, the very man, the word man made hard and, and, and strong, and the woman meant soft. There's something about the characteristics that God had placed within each one. And therefore, he calls for certain responsibilities based upon those characteristics. You, you, you see that he means more than just the point that somebody needs to lead, and it just happens that God chose a man. It, it relates to the very way that God created us. And, and the man is not just to lead, but to love his wife, to nourish and cherish her. And the wife is not just to submit, but to respect her husband. We're just looking at a structure here. Not planning on doing a marriage retreat today. Can you understand these two points? Wouldn't it be easier if as a man, because you loved your wife, and you nurtured her, and you helped to mature her, and everything that you had was hers. And therefore you, you made decisions that were good decisions based on how to care for her. Do you think you'd make her job easier to respect you? Let's go on a little bit. Children, you're not out of this yet. A couple of guidelines for children. One main guideline for fathers. And if we understand this and we incorporate this into the role of both the father and the mother, first Paul addresses children. And he chooses a word for children that includes older children as well as younger children. This is not just talking about the preschool kids. This is talking about everyone that would fill perhaps up to the time in which you would then leave your home. A young person. He's addressing a young person here. And he's saying this to young people. Obey your parents. And what he's saying to children is you also must place yourself under the authority of the leadership of your home. Because to obey your parents is to obey both your mother and your father. Amen? Amen. We place ourselves under their authority. We realize that God has given them for our well-being. That God will hold them accountable, our parents also, for the training of the children. And so therefore, we have a heart that wants to obey. And therefore, he also says that obey your parents in the Lord. In other words, if you are Christian children, you live in a such a way as a Christian, regardless of how ungodly your parents are. Obeying your parents, but walking in the Lord. And the same idea is found when it says that slaves are to obey their masters as if they are obeying and serving God. When you, when you work on your workplace, you, know, you are serving the employer that you work for as if you're serving God. Whether or not they're godly. The concept here is of serving a parent. 
carrying the spirit of the child as well, a, a spirit marked by the desire to please Christ, that I'm going to obey my parents because in obeying them, I am pleasing the Lord. This directive is given to children simply because it's the right thing to give. It's a simple observation that sets into place authority, that we, we need to have proper authority in the home, and children are responsible to, again, place themselves under the authority of the parents. It's a decision that we make as young people. It's given even to believing children. It refers to the fact that a child would be old enough as a believer to even remove themselves from the authority of their parents. Which to me is speaking of adolescence. You know, you get to a certain age and you say, well, I don't care what they say. I'm going to do my own thing. And, you know, in other words, Paul is saying here, you're making a choice to remove yourself out from under the authority, but I'm giving you the admonition of the Lord. The Lord says this, place yourself under their authority. It's an active choice. Amen? The command to obey this authority that God has placed in your life shifts to honor. As a child go out, establishes their own household. That, that we are placing ourselves under the authority, but as you go out from your own household, then you continue to honor your parents. And included in that is the weight of even caring for your parents in their old age. There's an honor that we continue to, to come under this uh, a guideline that God has given to us. But after Paul addresses the children, he turns back to the parents again. I know that he has both parents in view because it states that children are to honor and obey their parents. But then he addresses just the fathers. Because the father is called to take the lead in the training and discipline of the children. The, the, the father in a home carries a level of authority. And by nature of simply being a man, is less nurturing than a woman. Well, he should be. Sometimes the things are all messed up in our society. Paul's addressing men because it seems to be more normal for a woman to nurture a child. Amen? You're going to come alongside and, and, and be an advocate for the child. But he's addressing the father because he's saying that the father's role can be destructive if you're absent. Parents have a responsibility to pass on their faith to their children. And a key important role here is for the father to play in this role. There's two elements that the father's called to do. He's called to discipline and instruction. And you know what? We don't understand discipline in our day. When we think of discipline, we think of punishment. It's not really punishment. Discipline means that it literally means to give a good overall education, a good upbringing, to attain to a discipline. We speak about parents or fathers bringing up their children in the admonition and the discipline of the Lord. We're saying here that, that you're going to set a path for them. That, that you're going to create a good plan so that they, they will come to the understanding. You know, if, if I'm a runner, then the coach is disciplining me. He's not saying you've got to sit out in your room. No, he's saying that today we're going to do, you know, uh, uh, certain measured 440s. And, and then we're going to run a long distance. You know, and, and, and he's telling me what's next. Creating a plan so that I could become a better runner. Some of your children are involved in sports, you know, whether it be football and baseball coming later on and all of these things. And what does the coach do? He, he sets a plan so that there's a certain walkthrough, right? There, there, there's a certain aspect. Some of you are doing burpees or whatever else you do. You know, there, there's a plan. Somebody gives you a plan and then you follow that plan. And, and the, the following of that plan is to do what? It's to lead you stronger, to make you become better able to do what it is that they're doing. And so when we're talking about discipline, we're saying that it's a good overall education, a general upbringing attained by discipline. In other words, I'm going to teach you how, how to greet somebody. I'm going to teach you how to shake hands with somebody. I'm going to teach you how, how, how to get off your butt off the chair when an old person comes in the room. That's part of the 
discipline, right? Because the child don't know. But we teach them what does it mean to respect. How, how do we show that kind of respect? And the word instruction means this, to place in the mind. In other words, to, to teach someone how to think. How to follow the teaching that the Lord has given to us. And, and he's saying here that, that fathers, there's your role and responsibility. While the, the woman or the wife tends to be more nurturing, the father has to set a plan. But because she is more nurturing, here's part of the problem that we all face. You can stop barking orders. And you can lose sight of the fact that you're to train and discipline, but not to provoke not to bring somebody down, not to break their spirit. As Paul says, do not provoke your children to wrath. Here's the opposite thing. Don't just keep beating them down. Bring them up. Bring them up. Yeah, we, we used to use that expression, bringing up our kids. You know, that was part, part, part of the, the training process is that, you know, you're, you're, you know, in raising children, right? We use that other word, we're, we're raising children. What does it mean? You're, you're bringing them up. Yeah, pushing them down. You're, you're, you're causing them to be able to be released. Why? With the discipline that's necessary in their life so they have their own self-government that they don't have to have somebody telling them what to do all of the time. Because you've raised them up. Look, for many of us, maybe we haven't seen this modeled. We didn't see it modeled in our home, maybe. Maybe we don't see it modeled very much in our society. And that's why the church is so important. Because we can see the model in the church. And it's so important, Paul's saying, here's how we need to walk. Can we give this some thought? Women, wives, are you coming under the authority? Are you praying for your husband for the responsibility that God's given to him? Are you showing respect? simply because of the position of authority that they have. I don't know about you, but you know, have, have you ever had to fill somebody else's job when maybe they went away and you're really glad when you come back? You know, it's like you, you don't understand sometimes the weight that somebody else carries until you try to carry it for them. And, and, and Paul's trying to say, please, get, get into this role and understand there's a weight that needs to be carried. Doesn't mean that that person necessarily fulfilling everything in the right way, but there is a role and a responsibility that God has placed upon them. Pray for them. Do what you can to get under, to make a decision. Husbands, if you have to keep telling your wife you're the leader, you're not a leader. Hear me. If you have to keep telling your children you're the boss, you're not the boss. If you will train and build up and lead the way God has called you to lead, there will be no question who the leader in the home is. And how do you do that? By loving someone. By dying for them. I heard recently, and, and this is not, I don't want to say this in a, in a bad way, but I heard recently there was a, a young woman that got hit by a car on a street that somebody went quickly through. And the husband was crying out because it was his wife that was there. And right away, in my mind, went back to George Washington's Laws of Etiquette. You know what the laws of etiquette that George Washington taught? Was that the man is supposed to walk on the inside, not on the inside of the sidewalk, but on the outside of the sidewalk of the woman, because he's to protect her. 
we've lost our position. The man should have got hit if they were walking the way he was walking to protect. This is a serious thing. If we want to raise up godly children, if we want to see authority and respect brought back, if we want to order our church in a way that, that we can be light to the community around us, can we just think these few things this week? How can I respect, how can I ask you, Lord, to help me respect my husband and come under the framework, God, of what you have placed? Husbands, you give this thought. How can I love my wife and not just myself, but really love her in such a way that I'm willing to sacrifice? Hey, I'm going to a Donnie Marie concert. can I love my wife <laughs> to something that is important to her <laughs> to die of myself <laughs> to carry a fork with me while I poke it in my eye <laughs> she means enough to me Want to go? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Children, your parents carry a lot of weight, responsibility. God says obey them. In obeying them over time, you learn to respect them. As, as placing yourself under them, you'll come to honor them. It's, the place, it's a choice we can make. Amen? And parents, while we all are part of the training process, particularly fathers, don't be absent and don't provoke, but raise up. Raise up the children that are there. Encourage them in the Lord. And if we will follow this basic guidelines, then we can add the curtains and the furniture and all the other nice things that make our homes individual from each other. Amen? Amen? But we'll follow the guidelines that God has given to us, which is the wisdom of God. When we learn to walk this way, we can also come under authority in the church. We can come under authority in the job. We understand what it means to trust God. So Lord, I come before you today. And Lord, I, I know that the people that are here today have varying degrees of needs. You know what those needs are. We can't wave a magic wand and expect that everything's going to be okay. But every single one of us can play our part. And Lord, if we will bring ourselves under your authority and place ourselves where we need to place ourselves and ask you, Lord, that, that we could do this with a, with a heart of intention that says, Lord, I, I want to serve you. And I'm not just, but, 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 but. I'm, I'm going to just obey what it is you've given me. Help me walk it out. Lord, where there's situations where men need to be delivered, Lord, Father, we ask that you would move in a great dimension. Help us to understand our roles and responsibility, and then help us to encourage each other in that way. Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. And to whatever degree that we can be an example May it be so to encourage all of our brothers and sisters here together. Pour out your spirit in our lives, Lord. Heal our marriages. Strengthen our homes. Protect our children. 
Lift them up, Lord, to be able to reach their destiny that you have for them. And when we fail, may we be humble enough to seek forgiveness from each other. We want to walk, a walk worthy of the kingdom. Set in order those things in our lives that must be set in order. That when the wind and the rain and the waves come, our foundation is secure because it's hidden you. We just want to bless you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.